looked at each different colour on the graph represented a different body part, as you can see here with this slider. Um, and these were just generic ones that were made within the within the programme. Um, here it shows you along the frame index, the chance of the X and the Y, and again dotted across the, the image. Um, so now we're on part four. Um, so a software package for animal pose and estimation is Deep Lab Cut, but obviously now we're looking at how we can take those predictions of that particular body part being in that given position within that given frame at a given time, how we can use that information to understand what behaviour that animal is exhibiting within that moment and moments before and moments just after. Um, so, as I said, this is understanding the behaviours. Um, there's detail here. So this deep lab cut, deep lab cut utilisation is a whole kind of GitHub where it drives you into different methods of the next step. So, for example, Vame was one of the ones that was discussed earlier. Um, and Simba, which is the one that we're going to be talking about today. So Simba was released in April 23. Um, sorry, the newest version was released in April 23, but I believe it was released in 2019 slash 2020. Um, and there's, it's quite big. It's not just Simba. There's this one way of doing it. There's the region of interest way. There's, the, there's so many different methods within the Simba. It's like a bit of a minefield, to be honest. So we'll see how far we get. Um, and obviously, I'd love to do more sessions on this because it is a, it is a massive topic. Um, but I still feel like we've only to scrape the surface. Um, then we have got just a few videos, which I think are kind of worth the read. You've got this paper, the first link, which is a paper looking at gait in humans, which doesn't use Simba, use a different kind of methodology. Um, and it basically detects if they're going to have hip problems, not going to have hip problems. And then the second one is a paper on classifying social behaviours within animals in the lab, um, which does use Simba. Um, and it looks at how it takes the pose estimations from Deep Lab Cut. So then here is the whole workflow. So you can see the first triangle in red. Um, it goes around this kind of block, which says Deep Lab Cut, um, MA, DLC. So MA, Deep Lab Cut, which I think believe it means multi-animal Deep Lab Cut. You've got another one that says Sleep with an A. Um, deep pose kit support and interactive menus. Now, those are all ways that you can get pose information. Um, obviously, the last three sessions have just been on getting one of those. Um, so that just shows how big it is. And on top of that, there is also third party ways. Um, I know the gentleman today referred to some softwares that are used commercially. And I believe that those are also data that you can extract out of there and put into this pipeline. And there's loads of tutorials on all the different third party types of pose tracking and pose estimations. Um, so you, the first part here is kind of where we're up to. And then you've still got all of this here. Um, but in essence, just to summarise, overall, you have some data. You train that data to detect body parts and the position of those body parts within a video. You then train it, test it, and then you can then take that information and export it into another model where you either tell it using supervised learning or unsupervised learning, so you don't tell it, um, and you can use that to extract behaviours and what that data actually means. Um, there's multiple different me methods here. So one here is region of interest. Now, the region of interest one is something that I've kind of found interesting, but I'm kind of thinking, is that actually going to be viable for my purpose? So if you've got some mouse in a cage, then it doesn't matter how they're walking around that cage, they're still going to be at the same height within that within that video. Whereas if I'm looking at, which I am, a cow with its head in a trough, the height of that cow's head in that trough is going to change every time depending on how much feed is in that trough. So therefore, my region of interest that I draw for mice is not going to be the same region of interest that I draw for detecting where the head is within a feed trough. So 
therefore the problem that I've got is a little bit different. So how do I go about that, which is still the journey that I'm on. Um, but again, it's an interesting application. And, you know, hopefully you guys will think of other scenarios that you can think, you know, where the region of interest doesn't actually, or you might think that it not, you might think that it won't have that much of an impact or, or help in any way with the, with the question that you're trying to answer. Um, then just on to this part here. This here is the CSV file that we created. Um, I did show it earlier on where you've got the left ear and you've got the X and the Y and the likelihood of the left ear being at that X and Y coordinate within that frame. Um, how we got to that CSV file, really we did it the easiest way possible and there's still probably hundreds of hours that I could spend personally improving that and making that better, which I do intend to do. Um, but just for this purpose, this is a demonstration on how you can take those CSVs and you can import that tracking data into this Simba part of, of this pipeline that we've created. Um, our pipeline is Deep Lab Cut, and then it's Simba for this particular example. Then here you can see the analyze and the visualize data. So again, you've got your run model, which you do with Simba. You can get generate descriptive statistics. Now there is R packages, which are also mentioned today. Um, however, you can also go down the random forest um, path as well. So there's a lot that, that can be done there. So when it comes to installing Simba, the way I decided to do it is through Anaconda. Um, I tried to do it through Google Colab. It wouldn't it wouldn't have it. I'm, I'm not quite sure why it wouldn't have it, to be honest. I still need to do a lot more research into that. Um, and I did read something that said it doesn't actually even rely on GPU, which I thought was a bit odd because obviously it's running models, so that must have been incorrect. Um, but it does have a lot of dependencies. So the first one was I had to have Git, then I have to have FFM PEG, which is a media tool. Um, and then the FMMPEG came in a .7z file, not a normal standard zip file. So I had to have something that would decompress that file down from the web um, just so I could get it up and running. Now, with Deep Lab Cut, we did look at doing it this way and then kind of halfway through the parts of the presentation, I started using some code. Now, I felt comfortable doing the code because I understood from looking at the terrible user interface how much better the code was, but I knew what everything was trying to do and was trying to achieve. So personally, I think trying to do Simba in this kind of setup um, using the user interface is a good way to learn and understand what everything's trying to achieve. Now, within this FFM peg, there is a lot that you have to do behind the scenes with regards to changing your system variable. Um, and changing the path. So it's quite software y. Um, but if you click on that link, there's a full wiki how and how to do it. Um, I followed it, it was really easy and straightforward. Um, but once I downloaded all of these things using these functions, so first of all, you install Git, FFM, MPEG, your .7z file extension um, to be able to decompress the files. You can then open up an Anaconda environment and you can then run these following commands. So the first one is you're installing Simba, um, UW, and then TensorFlow, TF, which is crazy because they actually aren't actually dependent on TensorFlow anymore. So this is constantly changing all the time. Um, then it asks you to uninstall Shapely um, and confirming all that. And then it asks you to reinstall Shapely. Now, I'm not quite sure why it does that. Um, computer software isn't really my, my niche. Um, and I don't quite understand all the other dependencies because within this kind of Simba framework, you've got other dependencies. So, for example, they, it use a Sicket open, but it uses like version 5.2. And I think it's like version 11 now. So there is a lot of old ones. And Python, for example, it uses Python 3.6. Well, obviously, there's 3.11 now. So there's a lot of old stuff going on and it's quite scary actually because you're investing all this time in something that's got so many dependencies more than I think I've ever seen um, the list is endless on all the python packages that it's dependent on um, and then you can go into so once you've done all of that which I'm just going to show you um, this one now is I'm going to show how to load it 
and we can have a little look at that. So I'm going to go into my anaconda. I've got this environment here, which is called testing. I'm going to open up my terminal, so open terminal. And because I've done all the legwork, which was a very long time, I can click enter. And then this beautiful user interface, it's not really beautiful, but anyway, should pop up. And once I've got that, we can then start building the next step of our project. Boom, there we go. So it comes up. Obviously, it's very targeted around mice. <clears throat> and then you can use this file area here to create a new project or load project. Um, now, I tried to create a new project, but it was unsuccessful. So I tried to load one of those projects, a previous project that had been done. Again, I think it was referred to today about zebrafish, but it wouldn't actually allow me to, to load anything. So I'm basically going to talk you through the process back on the PowerPoint of all the different steps and I've got screen grabs of every step um, just so at least we have we can get into the nitty gritty of it a little bit more. And there we go, finally, I got it up and loading and, and it worked. So I was chuffed about that. So then the next steps is you can load and create a project. Now we did this with Deep Lab, Lab Cut and the Deep Lab Cut user interface was called Napari. Um, and again, it had this project file and it's the same with this. You can either load one and it's just a .ini file, or obviously you can create one which has got details on what, what you wanna have. So like the name, the date, all those kind of details. Then the next move is you've got your kind of CSV files um, from Deep Lab Cut, and you've also got your videos that you've had that relate to those CSV files. So this is where you put all of that information in. So the imported CSV files will be placed in a project, slash fo project folder. Within there, they'll be in CSV and they'll be in inputs. Um, and then you'll have the imported videos that will be placed in the videos um, folder within your project folder. So just like YOLO v5, just like Deep Lab Cut, you've got that core folder structure. So you've got the project folder within that. You've got your CSVs as inputs and your videos as inputs. Um, you can also remove any existing classifiers because obviously if you've trained some data, and now you're reloading that project and you want to remove those existing classifiers so you can retrain on a larger data set which may change your output. This is where you do that. Um, within the GitHub that I mentioned earlier, there is actually a um, API reference document and it does actually go through some of the key coding terms. But again, when I tried to load the Simba package, um, within Google Colab, it wouldn't actually let me load it up. So I kind of ignored that route and went down this route instead. So then now this is another part that's super important. So when you have um, a plain 2D image, you have got um, pixel values and you're interested in that pixel value for a given feature on that image and that fit feature will be like a curve, um, something interesting within the image that makes it unique to that image. So the kind of similar thing to that is when you're doing videos is you're actually looking at the distance of, of things. So you've got the distance of, um, for example, if it was an animal in a cage, it might be the distance from one cage to the one end of the cage to the next. Um, it's just specifying the real distance in millimeters so it can correctly identify features within the video. And then here is a good example. So this will be the type of feature that you will, sorry, not feature, the type of distance between millimeters that you will confirm for a given frame. And this information will feed back into that, that janky looking user interface here. And then you'll have one for each video. 
Um, and once you've got that, it allows you to, to contain a pixel value per millimeter, um, which is really important when it comes to getting the features for the video. So for example, a feature for a video will be the angle of the tail. It will be the distance from one end of a tail from one mouse to a distance of another tail on another mouse. Um, for my purpose, it might be the distance from the right nostril to the corner of the feed bin and how that distance changes over time. So therefore knowing that distance as accurately as possible with the real image is important. And one of the things you've got to be wary of with this is when you open up that Simba framework, you lose that, it, it kind of distorts. So you've got to make sure that it's not distorted basically when you do this so you get the correct measurement. Here is one video with the frames per second um, resolution and the distance in millimeters. And you can see that, that in the red circle that there's a pixel per millimeter value. And that pixel per millimeter value is really important for every single video that you have. Um, it, again, it enables the correct identification of new features. Um, there's also here the opportunity to add a column. So for my purpose, if I had 50 videos and 10 videos were of cow number one and another 10 videos were of cow number two, I can import that metadata here. So I can actually join that metadata so it's taken into account when finding, when, when doing the feature extraction step, which again is, I thought it was quite impressive that it, that it even thought about that, to be honest. Um, you can choose to use the same pixels per millimeter on all of your videos, which yet yeah, if you were in a lab and you had the same amount of same colouring all day long and there was no windows and the lights were just on permanently, then yeah, you pixel per millimetre probably would be exactly the same. But obviously out in the field, you're probably not going to get the same pixels per millimetre. Um, and then this, all this information, so the coordinates of the body parts in each frame, from deep lab cut, the frame rate, which you can specify, um, and the pixels per millimeter value enables you to do the, the feature extraction st step. Um, the feature extraction step calculates the largest set of features used for the behavioral classification part. And then, sorry, I've kind of stormed through this really, really quickly. <laughs> Um, then the next steps for the next meeting is to label the actual behaviours, create annotations for the behaviours, train the machine model and evaluate, evaluate the model on new unseen data. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I probably wasn't supposed to talk that fast there because there is a lot of information. But does anybody have any particular questions? Go on, Sarah. Hello, thanks, George. That was really interesting. Um, I noticed the huge number of decimal places in the pixels per millimeter, and um, I just wondered how that's measured. Because if you're measuring across a cage with a ruler, um, or or what are you using to measure across the cage? It's quite hard um, to get that level of accuracy. And also, how important is it? You know, I what, don't what, think what you're level. supposed to. Yeah, I don't think you're supposed to measure it like live. I think you're to, you're supposed to measure it on the video that you've actually got. So therefore, it automatically just does it from one point to another point on your knowing the width and the height of your video, making sure that it's not distorted. It just measures it like as if you were doing a line on Google Maps, like from this point to that point. No, I'm not sure what you're asking, um, or I'm not exactly sure, but I do know exactly how that tool works um, because it's a standard method in measuring things using computer photographs or um, or uh, or video. And the example picture that you showed, George, was <clears throat> of um, a little cage. And you saw that you had calibrated two points in the cage with a with a line and two points on each of the um, the two points that you're measuring between. But you would have you would have actually measured that with a real ruler in real life in some number of millimeters, like you know, 
15.6 or something and you enter that into the um into the little tool and it calculates that and so you'll get um to the accuracy that you define all of those decimals it's just a straight up calculation and it applies that then to every pixel like george described but you definitely have to calibrate it with a real measurement but but you wouldn't measure with a ruler to and significant figures, would you? No, it's a calculation. All of those, all of those decimals are a calculation based on a real measurement. You could measure it to any accuracy. The real world measurement could be uh, to you know zero decimals or to ten decimals if you have an instrument that would measure it that accurately. Um, probably you wouldn't. But the uh, the bit that's calculated in the program is just a calculation, so an arbitrary level of accuracy that doesn't really mean anything but i guess the default is very high accuracy it is in a lot of those programs can i ask a question george <clears throat> can you go back to the slide where you show the um one of the uh let's take a step back because I, th I think you did go through this stuff extremely quickly so right. uh, one, one of the steps uh that that you've gone through is this that one right there the one with the um the uh, likelihood and the xy coordinates there you go so what where i think you are in this um and i just want to ask you to talk about it a little bit about the stage that you're at <clears throat> so you have this stage that you talked about us a few weeks ago um where you you've captured some video from a feed bin and you you describe the reason that you captured the video is that you want to you want to be able to um, monitor each of these videos and categorize behaviors of the cows uh, and it's their feeding behavior so ultimately you're going to categorize certain behaviors that have to do with nutrient intake and there'll probably be a number of them right and the challenge you have is that um, there are a couple of feed bins and many, many cows, and you want to watch them for a long period of time. So you're using this tool to automate it. And uh, I think that you have captured some number of videos. I don't know. I don't have a feel myself for how much video you've captured um, to do this, but but it's some hours of video. Is, mm -hmm. it, is it some hours of video? Yeah, it is, yeah. I and, think it's uh, 62,000 62, seconds. OK. And then you have um, <clears throat> you have um, used a number of tools or identified a number of tools for a workflow. And the, the first part of the workflow uh, for anybody who was at the talk this morning, um, he went through this and, and so did you uh, or in an earlier talk, George, is that you're using Deep Lab Cut uh, to to identify those points in space on each frame in all the frames that comprise some segment of video. And you showed us an example of a novel of a novel one. And uh, then today you talked about, um, you went on to talk about then taking that data and classifying it into behaviors. And, um, but there's a lot of detail in between training that first model and then carrying on, on into, um, thanks, Sarah, into um, uh, classifying those behaviors. And I just wonder where you're at in that process. And one of the things on this slide, there were two slides that had this kind of data that uh, we went by quite quickly in your talk. Mm -hmm. But these may be examples of um, of predictions of the position of the the left ear in some frames. And so for for each of those rows, that it might be a frame. You have an XY coordinate for a particular frame of the video and then a likelihood. Now, I think this likelihood, it goes between zero and one, with one being, you know, the <laughs> ultimate certainty that you've got that left ear dot. But I just noticed that one thing I noticed, let's just talk about this for a moment is this your data and if so those likelihoods look a little low what do you think they're very low 
they're very low, but they were from two videos of training data, not thousands of, of videos. Because what I've done is for for my first year project report, this isn't actually in it. No deep lab cut stuff is in it. What I've actually got is kind of moved away from the deep lab cut because I'm actually just trying to understand statistically, is there a relationship? Um, and then this after would be like the automation step to capitalize on that relationship and make it a live process so we can constantly know that the cow has put its head down for that number of times and it's been eaten or it's been sorting for that number of seconds. Um, so what I've actually got is another spreadsheet where I've got every second of data, the weight at every second of data, the video second at that given weight point, and a category of what I think that behaviour, that cow, what behaviour that cow is showing within that second. Um, and that is what I've been working on. So I haven't actually brought any of those labels into this Simba yet. Um, I'm talking about the stage before Simba. I'm talking about because this isn't Simba is, or uh, is no, it? The, no, no, this is deep lab cut. This is deep lab cut. And yes, you're right. These likelihoods are extremely low and I need to do more pose identification videos and increase my number of samples that I'm putting in to increase my likelihoods. I'm you know, that is a very logical thing to conclude from this. And I just wondered um, how many training frames did you uh, did you use to get results like this? Two is videos. That, and and how many frames would that be? I don't have an idea of how long the videos are, what the frame rate might be 24 frames per second. I think it, it was 30 frames per second. So how many frames would it be? Uh, probably not more than 100, 110. OK, so like 100 frames, so a few mm. seconds of video. And, and then uh, and you've put through some novel video and and how much video have you tested it on? One video. Very is, small, yeah. Is it the one you showed us? So again, just a few seconds of video. Yes, yeah. OK. Yeah. It okay, is very so small, very, very small. OK, so it's basically it's early days. Um, this and maybe we're still working on the. Um, the um, deep lab cut part, we don't really need to worry about the classification part, not yet. Mm -hmm. So what's the next step? So the next step was for me personally, the next step is to improve the deep lab cut point part. But I don't want to spend too much time on that until I've focused on getting my first year report in for my PhD. Um, if we were to do another session on this, then I would just like to do a proof of like, this is how you actually identify a classifier for supervised learning, train the model using Simba. And even though the results that we get, we know are going to not be very good because these likelihood scores are really low. Um, it would just be a demonstration of a workflow, not necessarily a good model uh, and have good accuracy results, but it would be a, a demonstration just to show people what you can do with it. So you don't think at the moment you're going to use this in your PhD? So uh, no, I, I'm hoping to. I am hoping to, but it's not going to be part of my first year project report. OK. I have a follow up question on the likelihood because these are just quite low, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And and that's that um, that guy today seemed to suggest that with uh, a straight up transfer learning workflow, exactly like you're using here as intended in um, Deep Lab Cut, that uh, I, I think he said a, about 100 frames is what you need. I and think the other, the other reason that these are low is it shows it at every second and the first few seconds there isn't any data there. So like if I just go, if we just if I just show you the video. There's nothing initially in those first few seconds down here. So you think the uh, the probabilities further down are um, are better? Potentially, yeah. Is it easy to check that? 
because we have we have time to do that if you have the uh, dumps of those. So I am very curious about it. Th that's the only output you get, and that's the input to the next step. And um, I I was under the impression that you probably had done enough to run a lot of this video through there. Thing is, though, one thing that I haven't done within the pipeline is the corrections. So, like, for example, on that video, I know that it's labeled the nose as an ear. So obviously one of the one of the things that you're supposed to do in the workflow is you're meant to go back and correct it. And I haven't done any of that kind of fine tuning. OK. OK, uh, any other questions? <clears throat> OK, then let's uh, thank George. Thanks for that. Thanks for, I was thanks for that update. Question. Oh, go on. I mean, just a quick thought. Um, just make what George said about um, ears and nose and going back and correcting. I'm just because this is sort of like very new to me, is whether when you're doing this sort of exercise, you deliberately put some uh, training material in which potentially could get it confused. So uh, you sort of try and engineer a scenario where you you know you, you perhaps intervene and you I don't know, say it was a cow. You give it some food in a particular place by hand, so it tilts its head in a strange way to see whether. Uh, you, you, in other words, you're creating an what you might call an abnormal scenario deliberately to see whether that can then, whether the software can then pick it up correctly. Yeah, I think that's kind of more something. I wouldn't want to train the model on that because then I'm training it on rubbish data and rubbish in, rubbish out. But I would definitely test the model on that. You know, for example, if the camera got dropped on the floor on the feed bin, I'm then going to get nothing. And obviously I don't want it giving me false positives yet there's nothing there so you do that and and test on test it on the test data but i wouldn't put videos that i didn't think were a representation of what i'm actually going to see within my training data set okay we i think that's an interesting idea david but we uh there are there are limitations structural limitations for this particular tool like um, the way that this kind of tool works is that um, we start with a model that has been trained on lots of objects and it, it could be things like strawberries, trucks, you know, lorries, seagulls flying, a basket of chips. That's a seaside uh, theme maybe on that data set. They, uh, w what happens is you train through the layers of, of what they call a neural network and uh, each layer picks out small features. Like one one feature might be a set of pixels that are in a um, linear orientation that have the same contrast. Another feature might be a a curve um, that is a set of pixels that's an edge, and and so forth. And uh, all of the features together might be quite abstract. And uh, when you train on lots of examples of um, of different objects, uh, the the idea on these models is that they um, they assemble statistically those the sets of features, and that's what you start with. That's before you download this and start using it as a researcher. And then when you download it as a researcher, the the initial idea, the stage that George is at, I think, is uh, you find um, lots of examples of um, of the features that you want it to pick out, so cow ears. And if it's from a particular orientation, like straight above, those cow ears will look in one thing, in one way, and they'll have some features. When the cow turns its head, its ear might appear to have in two dimensions different features. And you would need examples of those. Somebody asked the question, maybe it was you um, in that guy's talk today, David about um, different orientations. I can't remember who asked that talk, like from a drone, or maybe Mark uh, Rudder asked that. 
and you would have to you would have to train the model from images from different angles to have to capture those features for the training. I I'm not sure about this yet. I, I want to see more um, in the future when um, you have time to work on this again, George. But um, I think my feeling is after seeing this and those probabilities is that I would I would like to see some of like a graph of the probabilities through the video that you've trained it on and and also um, I don't know how long I'll, I'll ask you this question after I spit this out how long it does take to train a, a very short video of three five or ten seconds to make the predictions but it would be interesting just to see a set of graphs to look at the probabilities and that would instantly give us a visual uh, answer for is this thing working on any level I, I can't tell from from really from watching yeah. the video and I can't tell from that little snippet of data you showed. Well, these are the plots um, that I have and one of these has likelihood on them. Um, so that's frame index. This is the likelihood. So zero, obviously the first few frames it is at zero and then it does shoot up. But obviously there's still some really poor ones. We're seeing a um, we're seeing your PowerPoint. You might be showing us something else. I can't see a thing. We're only well, seeing a PowerPoint. To be PowerPoint. honest, I'm, I'm glad because I've clicked on every folder on my Google Drive and it's a disaster. So, right, okay. Right, can you see that? Yep. So that is the graph. Okay. So I've got the graph, but I can't find the raw data file. Okay. Uh, but this, right. this is the graph of the, this is in the slides, and this is a graph of the output. Okay. Just for that test video, that one test video. OK, so I understand. So if we focus on the light blue, the very baby blue one, the right ear, that's a weird way to um, have the, uh, it seems unintuitive that you've got a continuous set of colors for discrete classifications. <laughs> but yeah. if you've got the light blue, that's the right ear. And I see the probabilities are floating at the top for the right ear. The left ear is the dark purple, OK? So, so for some weird reasons, it looks like slightly lower likelihood to detect the left ear. Is that right? Is that the way you're reading this? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. OK, all right, I understand this. OK. And very poor for right and left nostril, but that kind of does make sense because in my training data set, I didn't label as much right and left nostril as I did right and left ear because you couldn't physically see it because the head was down. And the X axis there, the frame index, so that's the number of frames that you've tested. Have you tested 500 or have you tested over 1,500? No, just, well, 500 with the actual cow in the image. The rest of it would have just been the dead ends. I see. OK, with the cow with no head in. OK, I got gotcha. you. So does that mean, again, I'm probably asking a dumb question here that it takes maybe in your case with that video maybe about a hundred frames to sort of get into uh, an area where it's making reasonable predictions and it's probably after maybe 150 or something that it starts to have a reasonable prediction of frames. Um, I, I for for this graph, I think what you what you're saying is like as it goes on, the prediction gets better within this one test video. Yeah. But I I mean it might look like that on the graph. It might at that particular frame rate, but that won't be because it's Cal already just sticks done. its head in at at frame seventy five or something. Ah, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. You see, some, you mentioned that earlier on, didn't you? Yeah. 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 I got it. And is this the this is the single video you've tested so far? Yeah. OK, but you have a lot of videos. Yeah, I do have a lot of videos. I, I'm, I'd like to actually share this with you, Ed, if you don't mind. Um, what I have actually been been working on. Yeah, maybe maybe uh, if you're coming to the lab meeting tomorrow, we do it tomorrow morning. OK, no worries. OK, that was very interesting, I think. Uh, I think that uh, is pretty good. We had some questions and conversation. Anybody else? Final questions? How useful is it? So obviously you've got feeding behavior of the bins. 
so it's one cow can access one bin and there's no real behavioural like it, usually on a dairy farm if you chuck all the feed out at the feed face you end up with a lot of like antagonistic behaviour obviously you don't get any of that in the bins can you take the software that you've trained so it understands how to once it's finished and it understands how to do everything and basically stick it over a normal freed front and still would it still be able to pick up the ears or would you have to basically completely retrain it to do that that is the aim to do that um it's just these videos are the ones that these videos are kind of a byproduct of a proof of concept project um so we kind of just wanted to try them in deep lab foot i think yes because they are only definitely trained on one cow at a time I would have to change it to a multi-animal um, deep lab cut at the minute it is just a single animal that's present so there would be some tweaking that would be required to get the best accuracy out of, I think Okay, um, well, thanks very much for updating a storage. Uh, oh, we have another question, Sarah. Hello again. I was interested in what Ed said about the, the pre-trained bit. So I'm not sure if deep lab cut is the pre-trained thing itself, or, or if you use that and are bringing something else in that's the pre-trained bits, please. The um, no, I, George will have to George will have to correct me, but I think the way that this model will work, like a lot of these models, a lot of computer vision classification models, that, that's what you would call this a, a a computer vision classification model built on a neural network. Is a have you heard the the phrase that's lately been in the news called a foundation model? It's the concept of a foundation model. It it's being used to refer to um, models like Chat GPT, these big large language models. They're referring to the um, to Chat GPT itself as a foundation model. And uh, likewise, uh, and what a foundation model means for Chat GPT, and then we'll come back to Deep Lab Cut. What a foundation model means is that um, that <clears throat> when we first train a neural network like this, it takes an enormous amount of data. Um, George, for your master's degree, do you remember how many how many bounding boxes you trained your model from scratch on? Hmm. I um, think it's about I'm plucking a figure out the air. I think it's about a thousand. There was a lot. Yeah. Well, I remember stem. it was it was about fifteen thousand. I remember it was about fifteen thousand. How soon you forget those other fourteen thousand bounding boxes you put around the stems? So it, it's a lot, and it, it's a lot of work to uh, draw the bounding boxes, and then it's a lot of work in terms of computational time, and, and it can cost money if you use a cloud service, um, or you can use um, a uh, a slower free cloud service. Um, it's a lot of time and money basically to train those models. And once you've trained them up, you've trained them up for all those little features um, like the edges, like the straight lines, like a high contrast um, circle between light and dark, like the uh, like several lines together. You put several of the features together and it might look like a feather. Um, you could put several radiuses together and it might be a wheel on a car or a bicycle and uh, once you have that collection of features some of them are so basic that they they occur in all kinds of computer images that might be useful to researchers or to other interesting people and when you have a model like that that's been trained on a, a huge amount of pictures so I don't know they started uh, it was a little bit of swaggering the, the computer scientists were doing. It's this started, I started noticing this about, it started a long time ago, but I really started noticing about 10 or 15 years ago where somebody would make a paper and they say, well, we've got this foundation model 
and we trained it up on a hundred thousand pictures. And then somebody would come out, oh, a hundred thousand pictures. We've just trained a model on a million pictures. And uh, it's the same thing as happening with these large language models. Um, I, I showed you, you know, some some of the models are uh, have have billions and some have over a trillion parameters and they've been they've been um, trained on trillions and trillions of words. OK, so they're getting bigger and bigger. These foundation models. The idea of the foundation model. For computer vision or any other kind of neural network is that um, if you have a particular case that you want to apply your um, your uh, this this particular model to rather than going back from scratch and training up a model with millions of images on your own and reinventing the wheel, so to speak, by redefining those those basic um, uh, foundational features that are present in in any image or or picture. Instead, what you do is you you add a few layers onto the end of a of an of a foundation model. So you train rapidly with a much smaller data set, your specialized data that adds just those good examples of the features you're interested in that the foundation model didn't know about yet. And that's what that's what George is doing here. This is a deep lab cut as a foundation model. It's useful to researchers because you don't have to train the thousands or tens of thousands of pictures beforehand. You just need to add a little bit. The guy, the guy this, af this afternoon said you could do it with as few as 100 examples, and George said she did it with about 100 examples. He was getting really high probabilities. I suspect if we looked in the, after looking at that probability graph, we will see some better probabilities, but maybe we need some more examples here. But th that's all it means, and there are different words for, um, there's different jargon terms for this practice. It's a standard practice. So we take a foundation model and you get a file that is the statistical weight of uh, describing all of those features that are the foundation features. And uh, that's what you start with and you just add a little bit to it for, for your custom version of that model. So that's called uh, a jargon term for that is called um, transfer learning. So you're transferring just a few extra features to the foundation model. And, and now the last, I have a question for George after all of that <laughs> I just spouted is, uh, I think that's what you're doing here. You do start with the, uh, the model weights and you're doing transfer learning here. Would you call yeah. it that? Yes, yeah, transfer learning. Um, the weights are already there. Well, obviously it creates its own model weights as well, depending on the training data. And it's a ResNet model. Yeah, so ResNet in this case is the foundation model. That's one of the it's one of the big um, it's one of the big models. As a matter of fact, ResNet is one that uh, a guy called Yan LeCun made. Yeah, and, that big book. He wrote that, that book as well, that, didn't he? He wrote that book. He works at Google. And who was his supervisor when he was just a wee child of a postdoc? It was Jeff Hinton, the guy that just resigned from Google. <clears throat> so they, those two guys, published ResNet, um, and that was um, that was one of, in a long line of swaggering foundation models with uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, examples trained on. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks, George. Thanks, everyone. See you. See you later. See you next time. I'm going to stop the video and then I'm going to scurry away. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye.